you all for joining the first remote hearing of the Subcommittee on Revenue, uh, select, Subcommittee on Select Revenue Measures. We find ourselves in challenging times as evidenced by this new method of conducting committee hearings in accordance with public health and safety recommendations. Okay, we're waiting for uh, YouTube uh, sound to come in. We have to pause for a moment. If you bear with us for just a moment, they're linking up to YouTube. Uh, we're ready to go now. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining the first remote hearing of the Subcommittee on Select Revenue Measures. We find ourselves in challenging times as evidenced by this new method of conducting committee business in accordance with the public health and safety recommendations. But the challenges we encounter here in Congress are small compared to what I hear and see and what I'm sure all of you hear and see in our communities. I'm glad we can move forward and do the work that our constituents need, given the difficult economic situations in which so many find themselves. The COVID-19 recession has laid bare the economic struggles of millions of American families. With almost no warning, the shutdown claimed tens of millions of jobs and American workers and families felt the ground fall from under them. Many had been just barely scraping by and unable to save much for a rainy day. And the sudden loss of income has left them with nothing. Food banks are seeing unprecedented demand and the country is on the verge of a rent crisis. Previously, self-sufficient Americans have lost their livelihoods and exhausted their financial reserves. The pre-pandemic prosperity never reached millions of American workers and families, and now they're facing financial catastrophe. Strong economic growth over the last decade has abundantly rewarded the wealthiest in our nation, but that growth has not been broadly shared. Despite the strongest labor market in 50 years before the pandemic, starting in 2009, with 128 months of growth, over a third of Americans had so little financial security that they would have been unable to cover an unanticipated $400 expense. Now, after job losses or reductions in hours and reductions in income, so many of our neighbors are facing financial catastrophe. Congress acted swiftly at the outset of the pandemic and we must do more to ensure that economically vulnerable people do not fall into irreversible financial disaster. As businesses gradually reopen, many workers are coping with drastically reduced hours and lower paychecks that will not cover their bills. Even people fortunate enough to be returning to work will likely be struggling for some time to come. The House passed the HEROES Act last month renewing Democrats' uh, commitment to help Americans stay on their feet until their jobs come back. The HEROES Act extends and expands economic impact payments, and it broadens tax, tax relief to the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and the child and dependent care tax credit. It also supports workers with a more generous employer retention tax credit to maintain payroll and additional credits to cover fixed costs and employees COVID-19 related expenses. Now the Republican Senate must act. It cannot continue to ignore the needs of American families. Millions of hardworking Americans have been thrown out of work through no fault of their own. 
and they need help with the basics like rental assistance and food. This is no time to abandon our fellow citizens. They deserve and should be able to expect our support during this extraordinary disaster. Before I recognize Ranking Member Smith for his opening statement, I want to mention another piece of legislation that would provide vital tax relief for a subset of Americans with disabilities who, are, who live in the United States. Mr. Kelly and I have legislation, H.R. 2086, the Access Technology Affordability Act, that would help blind employees and blind job seekers get the equipment they need to gain and then retain employment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Working from home has made exponentially more difficult when your ability to work is so reliant on expensive technology that many don't have readily uh, accessible outside of their workplace. I urge my colleagues to look at this legislation and work with me and Mr. Kelly to advance it. And I ask unanimous consent to have this statement I have from the National Federation of the Blind uh, entered into the record. And hearing no objection, such will be the order. With that, I will recognize the rank ranking member Smith of Nebraska for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling today's hearing. Uh, the partial shutdown of our economy due to the COVID-19 pandemic and congressional response to it through the Bipartisan CARES Act are both unprecedented. Before this pandemic shocked our nation, our economy was on incredibly strong footing. Thanks in part to an historic rewrite of our tax code and balanced regulatory relief, Americans were enjoying the strongest economy in years. In February, the national unemployment rate was 3.5%, GDP was growing steadily, and the highest wage gains in our economy were being seen by low wage, low wage earners because the demand for labor was so high. This downturn is unlike any other. Unlike former crises, it isn't the result of risky mortgages or irrational exuberance for technology stocks. The economic state we are in today is the result of state and local governments across the country asking Americans to stay home, socially distance, and protect themselves, their families, their friends, and their neighbors. This was important in order to lock down the virus. And on a federal level, among many things, we enacted the CARES Act on a bipartisan basis to keep a to keep a health and economic bridge with the goals of helping local businesses keep Americans working and supporting workers who temporarily lost their jobs. Our economy needed a cushion so that once health conditions permitted reopening, we could get up and running again. There are still many unknowns we must deal with, such as the future progression of this disease and how successful CARES Act programs ultimately will, will be in keeping our economy steady in the long run. However, we know Americans are resilient and want to provide, <clears throat> want to work to provide for their families. Many uh, Main Street businesses across my district tell me daily they desperately want to keep their doors open, keep paying their employees, and be able to continue serving their communities in the way they were until earlier this year. For this reason, our primary focus must be on ensuring future legislation is focused on reopening our economy and incentivizing a safe return to work. We are ready to work with you for as, as well uh, to contribute. In fact, Mr. Rice is working on a bill which will help businesses reopen safely. To restore worker and customer confidence, it would create a temporary tax incentive through the end of 2020 to help businesses defray costs for testing PPE and reconfiguring workplaces stores, plants, and offices. The CARES Act provided aid to our Main Street businesses. The popular PPP program was nothing short of successful in buttressing our economy these past few months, but more help may be needed. That is why we should also explore additional ideas to help businesses maintain liquidity during these trying times, which will help them keep their doors open and employees on the payroll as we resume our economy. In order to make sure returning to work is more rewarding than staying home, Mr. Brady has introduced a bill which would provide two weeks of enhanced unemployment benefits to Americans after they return to work. Ensuring that America has a strong economic footing while coming out of this pandemic 
is vital to getting people back to work. That is why we should make America more competitive in the global marketplace by increasing R&D incentives and making expensing, expensing permanent. We also recognize that helping Americans who were already on the sidelines to return to the workforce is much more challenging now than it was just three months ago. Demand for workers isn't the only issue. The pandemic has also made it harder for workers to access transportation, childcare, and other resources necessary to successfully remain in the workforce. We were working to address these issues prior to the pandemic, and the need is even stronger now. In 2018, we introduced the Jobs for Success Act to help states better utilize existing welfare programs to bring Americans most in need into good paying jobs. Our reforms would require states to work directly with the individuals to connect them with jobs. It would also improve the ability of states to utilize TANF funds to assist with supports like childcare and transportation to help people stay in the workforce. These were, these were bipartisan ideas two years ago and we continue to support them now. Mr. Chairman, we must work on a bipartisan basis to provide tax relief necessary for employers to resume employing, helps workers continue working and to ensure access to economic opportunities available to every American. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Without objection, all members' opening statements <clears throat> will be made part of the record. Uh, thank you to our distinguished witnesses for taking the time to appear before us today to discuss these very important issues. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to introduce the witnesses uh, before we get started here. First, Amy Matsui is senior counsel at the National Women's Law Center, where she works on economic issues affecting low and moderate income women and families with a special emphasis on federal and state tax policy. Indivar Duda Gumta is the co-executive director at the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality at the Georgetown University Law Center. He leads uh, work to uh, develop and advance ideas for reducing domestic poverty and economic inequality with particular attention to gender and racial inequality. Allison Bovell Aman, is the Director of Policy Strategy for Children's Health Watch at Boston Medical Center, where she leads the federal policy work of the program directed at improving economic well being through healthcare systems, integration to address social risk factors among patients and families locally and nationally, and inform policies that improve child and family health. The uh, next witness, um, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, I am going to ask our colleague, um, Ms. Delbaney, to introduce her. Ms. Delbaney? Are you unmuted? You may need to unmute. We'll, we'll give her a little time to, to get on and then uh, I'll introduce the last witness. Uh, Kyle Palmerlo uh, is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute where he studies federal tax policy. Before joining AEI, Mr. Parmalou was chief economist and vice president of economic analysis at the Tax Foundation, where he led the macroeconomic and tax modeling team. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is my honor to introduce. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hold on one second? I am. Okay, hold I'm on. Unmuted. Okay, hold on. Uh, where he was vice president of economic analysis at the Tax Foundation, where he led the um, macroeconomic and tax modeling team and wrote on various tax policy topics, including corporate taxation, international tax policy, carbon taxation, and tax reform. And now I will yield to Ms. Delbaney to introduce our final witness.
Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? We can hear you, yes, please go ahead. Okay. Now we don't hear you. Ms. Delbaney, are you there? Now we can see you. you Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, great. It's my honor to introduce Martha Rodriguez. Um, Ms. Rodriguez is a bilingual early childhood educator and a proud member of Moms Rising, where she amplifies women's voices on issues of national importance. Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. It must be my connection. We can hear you. I'm trying. I'm here, but um, I'm here, but I'm not sure if I have a strong connection because you keep losing me. You're, you're going in and out. Um, why, why don't why don't for the record recognize that uh, your constituent uh, Martha Rodriguez? I know, but can you hear me? Okay, we hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, let me let me just say that um, Ms. Rodriguez uh, is uh, Ms. Delbaney's constituent. They're uh, close friends. They work together. Um, Ms. Delbaney uh, has nothing but glowing comments to make for her. Uh, and she is a bilingual preschool educator facing economic hardships as a result of the COVID-19 recession. Uh, she has lost her job. Her husband lost uh, one of his two jobs and left and they've been left with it with part-time work she and her husband have two young children and um i know that uh miss delbaney wanted to make that introduction and uh sadly uh we're still wrestling through the challenges of the technology of these platforms that we're going to be using but um now uh, first let me say thank you uh, uh to all the witnesses for taking your time to be here uh, each of your statements will be made part of the record in its entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. To help you with the time, please keep an eye on the clock that should already be pinned in your screen. If you go over your time, I will notify you uh, with a tap of my virtual gavel. And we'll uh, proceed uh, with Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Amy Matsui, and I'm the Director of Income Security and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. The COVID-19 crisis has revealed the disastrous consequences of longstanding racial and gender inequities. Many Black, Indigenous, and women of color, women with low incomes, and immigrant women struggled to make ends meet even before the recession, and lacked enough savings to cushion the impact of the economic downturn. Women predominate in many frontline jobs, such as healthcare, childcare, and social service workers, many of which are poorly paid and or present substantial gender and racial wage gaps. Women are also overrepresented in sectors that have suffered devastating job losses, such as retail, restaurant, and other service sectors. Health disparities already faced by women, especially Black women, Indigenous women, women of color, transgender women, and women with disabilities have been exacerbated during the pandemic. In short, the women in communities of color who experienced the greatest disadvantages before COVID-19 have been hit the hardest by its health and economic consequences. Against the backdrop of a national reckoning with racial injustice, it is critically important to prioritize policy responses to the pandemic that center women and girls of color, especially black women and girls, and provide what they need to live, learn, and work with safety and equity. Congress now has the opportunity to enact tax policies that will advance racial and gender equity, increase economic security, and mitigate the effects of the recession. 
While many individual tax provisions leave out women, people of color, and people with low incomes, refundable tax credits like the Earned Income Tax Credit and Child Tax Credit especially benefit women of color. These credits boost incomes and help reduce the harsh economic effects of gender and racial inequity by narrowing wage gaps, improving health, education, and employment outcomes for families, and reducing poverty. Moreover, improving the child independent care tax credit, most importantly by making it refundable, would help low and moderate income families, among whom families of color and women heading households are disproportionately represented, meet the high cost of childcare. Refundable tax credits along with direct payments are also critically important interventions during recessions. They relieve the financial distress experienced by families who have lost jobs or wages, especially those without savings that would have helped them weather financial shocks. In addition, women and families with low incomes and low levels of cash on hand tend to spend cash benefits quickly to buy groceries, pay bills, and purchase other necessities. Expanded refundable tax credits and direct assistance thus would pump funds back into the economy to mitigate the recession. In the CARES Act, Congress provided for a one-time direct payment, but more must be done. Some especially vulnerable individuals and families were left out of the economic impact payments, including certain dependents and households who file tax returns using an individual tax identification number. In addition, millions of eligible people who do not ordinarily file a tax return are likely to miss out on the payments, and people of color are disproportionately represented within this group. Moreover, while economic impact payments unquestionably helped those who received them, many families have already spent them and need more resources to pay bills as they come due. Importantly, the HEROES Act would build and improve on the relief for workers and families in the CARES Act. The HEROES Act would improve economic impact payments to include many dependents and families who were left out of the CARES Act and enact an additional payment. In addition, the HEROES Act would enact improvements to the EITC so that low-income workers not claiming children are not taxed into poverty, improvements to the child tax credit that would lift millions above the poverty line, and improvements including refundability to the child and dependent care tax credit that would ensure low and moderate income families can access this tax benefit. The tax code has the potential to advance racial and gender equity and support an economy that works for all of us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I welcome any questions that you might have. Ms. Batsui, thank you very much. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Duda Gupta, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Indy Dadagupta, and I'm co-executive director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. I'm honored to come before this subcommittee to speak to the importance of leveraging the tax code to support working people and families during this recession. I've worked on tax policy for over a decade and was a Ways and Means Committee staff member before, during, and following the 2008 financial crisis. If we are to learn anything from that time, it's this. Policy makers must avoid ending anti-recessionary spending prematurely. Not long after enactment of the Recovery Act in 2009, policymakers shifted to austerity and our economy needed 89 painful months to close the job gap, jobs gap. In other words, it took nearly seven and a half years to create enough jobs to make up for those lost and to absorb new workers. We now face a far deeper recession, but have the opportunity to avoid repeating the past and avert needless human suffering. The Congressional Budget Office estimates a nearly $16 trillion output gap, nominal output gap over the next decade. Individuals and families are experiencing record levels of unemployment and hardship. As of late May, net job losses during the pandemic amounted to nearly 20 million and upwards of 35 million workers may be receiving or waiting to receive unemployment assistance. Workers of color, especially Black and Latinx women, have been especially hard hit by job losses. To be sure, early federal, the early federal response, including the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and CARES Act, provided an essential down payment, but it is simply not enough. These measures, however unprecedented they may seem, actually fail to match in duration and depth the financial struggles families are facing now and through at least 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic and recession warrant additional measures that are substantial and sustained. Despite the worst 
economic conditions in generations. Some key federal support programs are even slated to end in the coming weeks. And at a time when households and state and local governments are cutting back on spending, the federal government alone can spend more to help us weather the crisis. Well-designed federal spending today is an investment in a durable and equitable recovery for families, communities, and businesses. We must marshal a wide range of strategies to ensure that we build a stronger economy coming out of this recession. <clears throat> we must, uh, these strategies should be targeted and wide reaching to meet the need. And while structural fixes to the tax code are ultimately necessary, there are a number of measures that we can take right now to help mitigate the crisis, including one, providing additional and more inclusive recovery rebates or economic impact payments, regardless of immigration status, age, or banking status. Two, expanding the earned income tax credit to more aggressively phase in for families with modest earnings and to reach all adult workers without qualified children with a larger credit and more, more households in Puerto Rico. Three, increasing the maximum child tax credit, providing that maximum credit for children in the poorest household and including families with older children in the CTC. Four, making the child and dependent care tax credit fully refundable to help families meet a high cost of care. And five, establishing a meaningful option to pay more refundable tax credits outside of tax filing time, as we do to help families afford health coverage through health insurance marketplaces. Any of these provisions and more are in the House passed HEROES Act, which has been waiting in the Senate for weeks. Let's not forget that there's a virus threatening the lives of millions of Americans beyond the 117,000 or more who've already died from COVID-19. The actions Congress takes or fails to take in the coming weeks will determine whether we prevent financial ruin and unbearable hardship for millions of workers and families, people who have sacrificed their livelihoods to save lives. Our lowest paid workers and black people, indigenous people and other people of color are especially at risk if we fail to provide ongoing support. People of all races and ages are already experiencing entirely preventable joblessness, evictions, foreclosures, hunger, stunted educational outcomes, disease, and death. By helping people afford to stay safe, supporting families' mental health and well-being, and improving children's long-term health, tax policy is public health policy. With its ability to reach tens of millions of households with speed and efficiency, the tax system is a vital tool in fighting this recession as well. Together with other key policies, including expansions to SNAP, housing assistance, and unemployment benefits, increased support for childcare, permanent and robust paid leave, and state and local fiscal relief, tax policies can deliver assistance now and jumpstart a lasting recovery. Now is the time to push these levers as far as we effectively can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bobel uh, Aman, you may please proceed. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Allison Bovell Ammon. I'm the Director of Policy Strategy for Children's Health Watch, headquartered at Boston Medical Center. Children's Health Watch is a network of pediatricians and public health researchers committed to advancing equity and improving the health of young children and their families by informing policies that alleviate economic hardships. We are also honored to lead the Healthy Families EITC Coalition, a multi-sector network in Massachusetts committed to improving refundable credits. As I will discuss, based on our research from Children's Health Watch and experience at Boston Medical Center, families with children are already worried about paying for rent and putting food on the table today and in the coming months. Women-led families, families of color, and immigrant families are disproportionately impacted by the current recession, and based on previous recessions, they will continue to struggle well after the economy as a whole recovers. The depth and the breadth of this crisis will affect a generation of children and, and will have lifelong health impacts. However, this reality does not have to persist. The choices made here in Congress could change this. Families need urgent relief and long-term supports through direct payments and improved refundable credits to the weather the effects of this crisis. The work of Children's Health Watch begins in pediatric settings where we interview parents of young children in hospitals in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, and Little Rock. Our work demonstrates that when families are unable to afford food, rent, and utilities, the health of children and their families suffer. 
During the Great Recession, we showed that families with young children, especially immigrant families, were hit hard and experienced high rates of hardship well after the official end of the recession. The current recession our nation is facing is deeper and more devastating for many of these families. And this reality is playing out where in clinics where Children's Health Watch has research sites. At Boston Medical Center, where many of our patient families struggled to afford basic needs prior to COVID-19, we were alarmed over rapid increases in hardships. In response, our pediatrics department has taken extraordinary steps to distribute grocery store gift cards, diapers, hygiene products, and cleaning supplies, and create an emergency housing assistance fund. Staff have worked tirelessly to ensure that families are connected to all available state and federal resources, including an effort led by StreetCred, a free tax preparation site at Boston Medical Center to ensure families are able to claim their economic impact payments. All of these efforts, of course, are being done on top of essential pediatric care, telemedicine, and the introduction of a mobile vaccine unit. And while these efforts were necessary to support patient families, we are keenly aware that they do not reach enough families, are insufficient for fully meeting needs, and are unsustainable over the long term. Strong federal responses are necessary to adequately respond to a crisis of this scale. While the virus itself has largely spared most children, we cannot lose sight of the fact that families with children will likely suffer the greatest long-term health consequences of this economic crisis. Nationally, children are being pushed deeper into poverty and economic hardships are skyrocketing, particularly among Black, Latinx, and immigrant families, which in turn exacerbate health disparities. But all hope is not lost. The benefits of the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit have already been proven effective in the Great Recession as they lifted millions out of poverty, decreased income inequality, and increased workforce participation. The EITC is also strongly associated with a decrease in infants born with low birth weights, better mental health for children and their mothers, and improved life expectancy. Given these benefits, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently categorized EATC as one of the key evidence-based cost-effective interventions for improving health in early childhood. Today, implementing both rapid and long-term measures to reduce economic hardships is critical for the current and future health of our nation. While the CARES Act provided immediate relief through economic impact payments, the payments excluded 30 million people and income eligible families namely immigrants, teenagers and young adults, and adults with disabilities. The HEROES Act includes expansions and improvements to the economic impact payments, child tax credit, and earned income tax credit that will reduce po child poverty and improve health for years to come. These measures are needed now. Children and families struggling to afford basic needs cannot continue to wait. Using the tax code to administer cash benefits to families throughout the economic recovery are not only important for alleviating hardships, but they are part of our nation's public health infrastructure for building a healthy population well beyond the end of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, you may proceed. Good morning, Congressman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith of the subcommittee. My name is Marta Rodriguez. I live in Renton, Washington, and I'm proud of member of the Mom Rising. I'm also a bilingual early childhood educator and a mom of two incredible children, a daughter who is 11 and a son who's eight. The coronavirus pandemic has devastated my family financially. I know firsthand how urgent it is that we provide families immediate financial relief during this uncertain uncertain time, as well as make changes to our tax code and build upon the support that helps struggling families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Before the pandemic, my husband and I each worked two jobs to make ends meet. My husband worked as a bartender as well as kitchen helper in a school. I work as a bilingual instructor in a preschool and an after school program. We work long, hard hours to provide for our children. We live paycheck to paycheck, and we're struggling to build up our savings. Then, in the middle of March, our workplace suddenly closed due to the pandemic. I lost both of my jobs. On the same day, my husband lost his job as a bartender. 
overnight my husband and I went from having four jobs to just one. Suddenly we were not worried about contracting this terrible news, new virus. We were also worried about how we will cover basic expenses like food and our mortgage. We applied for unemployment insurance, but I was not approved because I had been working part-time job. My husband still has his job as kitchen helper, so his unemployment benefits are limited. He's still working about 20 hours each week, but that job alone is not close enough to pay our bills. We are not sure what to do. The job market is very tough right now, and we worry about public facing jobs that will put us at risk to contracting the virus still. We look into getting job at Costco or Target, some of the few employers that are hiring in our community. But my husband's schedule changes every week. It will be very hard to find a second job that is willing to schedule him around his first. For now, my kids are home from school and one of us needs to be care of them. There's no way we could afford childcare. As an educator, I'm working very hard to homeschool them right now. So it's important to me that we do everything can to keep them on track. This situation has caused a fin financial crisis for my family. We want to be working, but we are not sure when we'll be able to do. We are depending on food banks. Our mortgage lender has given us three months extension, but once that ran out, we owe them a lot of money that we simplify don't have. We are terrified and don't know what we are going to do when the extra time runs out. The direct payment checks that we issued in April will have a huge of short-term relief for us. We use them to keep up with bills so we are now facing a mountain of debit. At the end of this pandemic, whenever that will be, but while these checks were helpful, our mortgage alone is about 1500 a month. Families like mine are struggling and we won't have many options. We need additional relief if we are going to get back on our feet in such and certain time improving and expanding the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit will be also a huge help to my family. We can know what our income will look like over the course of the next year. So when we, when we do return to work, it's hard to say where we'll be working, what our wage will be or how secure those jobs will be. Improvement made in the HEROES Act, like incre increasing the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit and making fully refundable will give us peace of mind that our challenge this year won't hurt as of this year's come. All of these measures will go a long way in help in helping parents like us, as well as busting our hurting communities and a struggling economy. To recover from the pandemic, we need to address the needs of working families first and foremost. As you discuss strategies for support families through the tax code, I hope you will remember my story and thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Mr. Pomelo, uh, you may proceed. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about tax policy and the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In my testimony, I will make four points. First, Although there is room for improvement, the tax provisions in the CARE Act provided timely economic relief to individuals and businesses. Two, 
There are signs that the economy is doing somewhat better, but it is still not in great shape and businesses and individuals will need additional economic relief. And any additional assistance through the tax code should be well targeted and temporary. Three, lawmakers should avoid arbitrary denials of appropriate tax relief. And finally, Although the federal government's fiscal imbalance must be addressed at some point, lawmakers should avoid raising taxes while the economy is still weak. In response to the economic slowdown, Congress has passed five pieces of legislation providing a total of $3.6 trillion in economic relief. A significant portion of that was in the form of tax relief in the CARES Act. The CARES Act included rebates for individuals, tax relief for businesses, and employer-side payroll tax relief. The largest single revenue provision in the CARES Act were the economic relief payments for households. Businesses received uh, in, an increase in cash flow through the tax code um, as well, and that was through the temporary expansion of net operating loss deductions, temporary increase of the amount businesses could deduct against taxable income, among others. Now, although I think there are ways you could improve these tax provisions and the rebates, I think they generally did a good job providing assistance to individuals and liquidity for businesses. Over the last couple of weeks, we have seen some signs that the economy is improving. However, the economy will remain well below its potential for at least several years. Just today, the Labor Department reported that another 1.5 million people filed for unemployment benefits last week businesses and individuals will need additional support. But if lawmakers continue to use the tax code to provide assistance, they should ensure the tax relief is temporary and well-targeted to both individuals and businesses affected by the pandemic. Unfortunately, some recent proposals have failed to be geared towards addressing the current economic situation. For example, the White House has suggested enacting a number of narrowly targeted tax deductions for certain industries or activities. Likewise, House Democrats in the HEROES Act have suggested lifting the limit on the state and local tax deduction. These provisions would unlikely to be helpful and be poorly targeted to those in need. Related, I think lawmakers should avoid arbitrarily limiting appropriate tax relief. In the, Her the HEROES Act, House Democrats would pare back the loss provisions provided to businesses in the CARES Act. For example, they'd reinstate the pass-through loss limitation and make it permanent. In addition, it would allow the use of carryback for corporations, with, or it would disallow the use of carrybacks for corporations with excessive executive compensation, dividends, and stock buybacks, and it wouldn't allow losses to be carried back to years before 2017. I think there's little justification for these arbitrary limits. The recession caused by the pandemic and the federal response will add more to debt as tax revenues fall and spending increases. And lawmakers may have an interest in addressing those imbalances at some point uh, through tax increases and spending cuts. However, today the cost of borrowing is very low. The yield on the 10-year treasury has been below 1% since early April, and federal interest costs have remained relatively low for the past few years, even when interest rates were higher. Raising taxes now or cutting spending would impede economic relief and recovery. Higher taxes on businesses would reduce their cash flow, make it more difficult for them to maintain payroll, Likewise, higher taxes on individuals would have a short-term negative impact on their budgets. So to conclude, tax policy has been an important component of the federal government's response to the pandemic-induced economic slowdown. While there is room for improvement, many provisions provided needed relief for businesses and individuals. And although tax policy can provide temporary relief, there is a limit to its effectiveness in the current situation. Ultimately, the most effective way to get the economy back to normal is to get the virus under control. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And without objections, uh, each member will be recognized for five minutes to question our witnesses. We will not observe the Gibbons rule in this remote setting and will instead go in order of seniority switching between majority and minority members. Members are reminded to unmute yourselves when you're recognized for your five minutes. 
I will begin by recognizing myself. Ms. Rodriguez, I'm very sorry to learn of the difficulties your family has been experiencing and hope that you're able to get back on your feet as quickly as possible. Did your family receive a stimulus check? And if so, were you able to use it on necessities to help your family cover expenses? And if you were to receive another stimulus check, would it be helpful to your family? And if so, how do you think you would use that? Yeah, we did. We received the, uh, the check and was really helpful for our family. Uh, we pay our, um, our, mor our mortgage and we pay food. So if we receive another, we'll be really helpful because right now we just received an email yesterday that the school is not going to be the same. So it can be hybrid right now. So I'm pretty sure I'm not going to, I'm, I'm the third person on the classroom. So I'm really nervous about to have my job again and over who's going to take care of my kids. So I'm thinking about that. And so many parents, they don't know what's going on in the school right now. And the school system is going to change. So we'll be really helpful because I'm, I'm really, really sad about it. I was like, I really like to, I really love my job, but I'm really nervous about what's going on with my family. You know, I, I lost one of, one of my house and I don't want to lose what I have right now. But okay. we don't know what's going on. I don't have family here. And I know how hard it is to pay a childcare. So even if my husband returned to work as a bartender, um, it's going to start working like 25% of the people or 55% of the people. So it's not going to be the same as before, you know? So. We, I'm really nervous about that. Okay, thank you, thank you very, very much. I can't imagine how difficult it would be. And you're a family of two with four jobs before this. Uh, there's families that um, that are in every bit as bad a situation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Duda Gupta, uh, welcome back to the committee. Uh, we're pleased to have you with us. I wanna inquire about what the pandemic recession uh, is helping us understand about the pre-pandemic level of financial uh, uh, fragility among American families. With food banks facing unprecedented demand and the country on the verge of a rent crisis, give or take 13 weeks into the situation, it seems clear that the supposedly strong pre-pandemic economy did not give millions of families the opportunity to build up a cushion. Is that the case? Yeah, thank you, Chairman Thompson. It's a uh, delight to be back from this side. Um, that is exactly right. Uh, if the pandemic didn't reveal for those who didn't already know how fragile the financial circumstances were of a large share of households, even after the longest economic expansion in history, uh, in recorded U.S. history, I'm not sure what, what would. Um, First, uh, let's not forget that the overall unemployment rate masks enormous variation with African-Americans, for example, typically facing double the unemployment rates of uh, white uh, workers in the U.S. economy. Um, second, uh, as already been pointed out, a very few families could weather um, any sort of uh, financial emergency of you know, several hundred dollars. Um, this is, you know, Federal Reserve uh, Survey of Consumer Finance data, um, but other data confirm the struggles that families would face uh, if they went well, just one week without um, a paycheck. Let um, me ask, and then, you, ask you on, on that, what alternative policies should Congress pursue in the future that would help more low and middle income families attain uh, financial stability during the next recovery period? That's a great question. Um, look, uh, first, I think that we have a major challenge in this country of low paying jobs and unpredictable and unfair work schedules on top of it. So um, we need to obviously raise the minimum wage, complement that with robust work supports like the earned income tax credit. Um, but also we need to deliver a 
basic floor of income to folks, including through something like the American Families Act, which the HEROES Act includes a version of uh, to ensure that every child in this country uh, lives in a household with at least some minimal uh, income. Um, we live in a country where, uh, at the end of the day, cash is essential. Um, we can do a lot and need to do a lot through uh, caregiving um, supports. For example, uh, our friends at the National Women's Law Center have called for at least $50 billion in additional child care uh, funding for immediate relief, which would create jobs directly and indirectly. And in generally thinking about uh, a new care economy and investing in these jobs uh, would help families weather these crises. Um, why is that? Because right now, you lose your job, you can also lose access to child care. Right now, because of the pandemic, schools had to shut down. So families um, are struggling every which way. And uh, we can do a lot more to create jobs that aren't going to be offshore, that aren't going to be outsourced, and that enable other jobs. Um, there's more, but I think the tax and transfer system and direct spending uh, can do a lot to help families prepare for and weather any future crises. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Matsui, given the pay gap between men and women, which is sizable for white women compared to white men, but even more sizable for Hispanic and African-American women, can you tell us more about the role that the uh, EITC and the refundable child tax credit in fighting disproportionate levels of poverty amongst women? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, I would like to emphasize that the improvements to the EITC and the child tax credit proposed in the HEROES Act have been estimated to impact particular low-wage jobs. These include healthcare jobs, restaurant work, retail, um, nursing jobs, and these are jobs with low pay that women tend to be disproportionately represented in, and especially women of color. So it is a little bit of a cycle that women who are in low paid work who face wage and um, wage gaps um, are more likely to be eligible for the tax credits for families like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. But as a result, they're helped more by these credits because of the boost in income and the benefits for their families that are provided. Thank you very much. And then um, Ms. Bavel Amon. Uh, I'm interested in the fact that your organization is dedicated to improving the health of low-income children, and your organization became advocates on the earned income tax credit and the refundable child tax credit as a means of promoting better child health. Can you tell us more about how it was that you came to understand those two things being so closely connected? Yes, thank you. Over our two decade history of Children's Health Watch, we've continually tried to seek um, out policies that not only address family economic hardships, but also are able to mitigate the poor health outcomes associated with hardships. And so when we were approached with this research question in 2014 around whether um, refundable credits could be um, a, a policy lever for improving child health, we were eager to learn more. And what we discovered in talking to experts, listening to people's live experience, talking to social service providers, and really doing a deep dive on the literature is that EITC was not just a, um, a policy that could reduce poverty and increase workforce participation, which of course it is, but there was an emerging body of evidence around the impact that it would have on child health. Namely, one of the there were multiple studies done that showed that expansions of the earned income tax credit have been associated with decreases in low birth weights, which is incredibly important for child health for a couple of reasons. When children are born at a low birth weight, it has implications for their long term growth, health and development. It's also costly to health systems. And yet there's very few medical interventions that we can deploy that effectively reduce the risk of low birth weight and the way in which um, policies like the earned income tax credit do. And so we were um, excited to start working on this because this really shows the power that putting financial uh, monetary resources in the pockets of families can have um, on both short term and long term health outcomes. Thank you very much. Uh, now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Smith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Pomelo, as you discussed in your opening testimony, the CARES Act contained many targeted tax provisions that provided relief to individuals, families, and businesses. For individuals and families, the CARES Act provided 
for a one-time payment, sometimes called an economic impact payment, allowed for penalty-free distributions from retirement accounts, and provides an above-the-line deduction for up to $300 of charitable giving. For businesses, the CARES Act provided for the carryback of net operating losses, which allows businesses to receive tax refunds, provided a relaxation of the interest limitation rules, and accelerated the refund of certain business credits known as alternative minimum tax credits. These provisions were all designed to provide cash relief to both families and businesses, and we have all heard stories in our districts as to the help that it has provided. I'd like to focus on the tax relief policy that is targeted to businesses. Mr. Pomerlo, uh, we are sometimes told that if a tax policy helps business, it cannot be positive for individuals and, and workers. Why is this not the case? And can you give some examples of how business tax policy actually directly helps workers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I think to some degree, the distinction between business tax relief and individual tax relief um, isn't a very helpful distinction because a lot of these proposals that were put forth were to provide one direct assistance to individuals and assistance to businesses. And the assistance to business was to attempt to help businesses maintain payroll. Maintaining payroll is maintaining the connection between the business and the individual so that they can keep their employment. Uh, and I, one example of this um, that from the CARES Act was actually the deferral of the employer side payroll tax. Um, this deferral allowed businesses to delay the payment of the tax that they pay on the amount that they, uh, the payroll that they pay to their workers. This effectively for a short period of time reduces the after tax cost of keeping employees hired um, and all, you know, holding everything else constant should make it easier for workers to keep connected to their jobs. Um, there are other examples of this too um, in the general tax code about how tax policy that can affect investment can eventually impact workers, but I think it's less of a concern in the context of the CARES Act. You also testified that Congress should avoid raising taxes uh, at this stage of the recovery while the economy is obviously still weak. Uh, will you elaborate on why that would be unwise? Yeah, so as I mentioned in my in my testimony, that a lot of the goals of the economic relief, um, whether it was the CARES Act or other provisions, was to increase liquidity for businesses and to help households um, maintain their budgets and to continue to pay their mortgage and their bills. Um, and that I think raising taxes um, for businesses or for individuals will work against that goal um, and make uh, economic relief more difficult and may make things uh, worse than they otherwise would be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, thank you so much for your participation here in, in the hearing today. I think it is important that we hear from you. And uh, I know that you represent many families who are, are struggling. Uh, you are giving voice uh, to many of those, of, of those these folks who uh, certainly are a vital part of our, our country. Um, would it, do you feel that um, it would be helpful if we did provide incentives to businesses so that you and your husband's jobs were actually safe to return to? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh can you repeat the last thing again, please? Sure. Do you believe that it would be helpful if businesses received incentives so that you would see a safe workplace to, to return to, so uh, that the, the you know measures could be taken uh, that uh, em employers could could make to make sure that the disease doesn't that the virus does not spread in the workplace, whether it's the equipment and the gear or the methods and, and the technology. For sure, yes. Okay, well, I, I appreciate really that. Yes, I, I really we appreciate really it. We really want to go back to work. I, that, uh, that's, uh, that's our goal, and I appreciate you sharing that. I, your perspective is, is vital, and I'm glad that we've had this opportunity to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Doggett, you're recognized for five minutes. Can you hear me there, Mr. Chairman? I can hear you. Great, thank you. 
And thanks to all of our witnesses. Uh, as they have indicated, uh, the widening income gap and racial disparities that we have in America today uh, have been intensified by this pandemic, but they are longstanding. We know that people of color are overrepresented in our frontline jobs from nursing homes to meatpacking. Uh, they're keeping our company, country open, but often with low pay in relatively unsafe conditions. I believe that every action that our committee takes must look to providing relief that addresses this inequality. At the very least, let's not make matters worse. Uh, we can look to the 2008 crisis as an example, because there, while the big banks and their executives who contributed so much to causing the crisis recovered rather swiftly, many middle class and working families are still not fully recovered from being hit so hard uh, and now they face uh, the pandemic and economic crisis related to it. As we consider uh, how to best deliver assistance to working families through the tax code, we also need to recognize that for years, our tax code has helped perpetuate inequality instead of reducing it. Through the years, our House Ways and Means Committee has played a major role in widening income uh, inequality in America particularly through the Republican 2017 tax law, which showered benefits on the wealthiest. One study found that this Trump law disproportionately benefited white families while leaving behind families of color. Too often, the committee, even when it is pursuing worthy objectives, like encouraging retirement savings, leaves the poor behind and widens the gap. Unfortunately, the pandemic relief that has been enacted in recent months repeats some of these mistakes. Under the CARES Act, 60% of the tax provisions cost for this year are for businesses, most of which come with no strings attached to ensure that a company maintains payroll. The Congressional Budget Office recently affirmed that aid to state and local governments and other direct expenditures are far more effective as stimulus than tax expenditures directed to corporate tax breaks. While corporate tax breaks offer less effective stimulus, they are certainly effective and efficient in widening the income gap. While a low-income worker like Ms. Rodriguez anxiously awaits a $1,200 stimulus check, the so-called net operating losses provision that was included in CARES delivered an average of 1.6 million no strings attached for just 43,000 taxpayers. These were people that averaged more than a million dollars in annual income already. This privilege group pocketed over 80% of the benefits, which at a total cost of $135 billion was more assistance to them than all of the hospitals in America through the same act. The HEROES Act would repeal that horrible provision, though it remains to be seen how great a priority is being placed on that repeal in negotiations. Many uh, large corporations now claim that the more than $400 billion in tax breaks that they've already received from CARES is just not enough. As the stock market soars, and while hundreds of billions of additional assistance for large corporations remains untouched and available through the Federal Reserve, they claim they need more to ensure liquidity. As small businesses and frontline workers are struggling with millions of Americans, as Ms. Mansui has pointed out, who have not yet even gotten a stimulus check or were deliberately excluded because they use an I-10 to file their taxes, some large corporations are already seeking a second helping, and Republicans seem determined to deliver it to them while opposing relief to the families that we have provided through the HEROES Act. President Trump's economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, says what we need to do is slash the corporate tax rate in half for companies that bring jobs home. Unfortunately, the Trump tax law already allows companies to pay half the U.S. tax rate on offshore investments, and in some cases, even zero. And since no tax break, however well targeted, zero, uh, I think we end up paying for nothing if we adopt the Cudlow approach. While Republicans have stood in the way of expanding refundable tax credits for working people, like the EITC and the Child Tax Credit, 
which as we've heard today are so effective in lifting people out of poverty, they're now lining up to make tax breaks for large businesses refundable, though they use the fancy name of monetizing tax credits. Let me just ask Ms. Matsui uh, if she agrees uh, that the most effective stimulus is providing direct assistance to those who need it the most, and that we should avoid giveaways to those at the top in favor of taking that approach. Thank you for your question, Congressman. I do agree that um, for working families who make up and power our economy, especially the frontline workers and essential workers that we're relying to make our economy and make our basic needs at the moment, um, providing support and assistance for those families through the tax code, I believe strongly should be a priority. Thank you for your question. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You, the gentleman's time has expired. Let me remind members to please leave enough of your five minute questioning time for the uh, uh, witnesses to get an answer in. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Mr. Rice, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Rice. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Mr. Pomelo, the most effective anti-poverty program, would that be another government stimulus check or would that be getting people back to work? So I, I think it depends on where we are with, with the virus. Um, so if we think that the economy is safe to reopen um, and that individuals think it's safe to go back to work, um, that can allow the, the economy to recover and people to get back to work and earning a paycheck. Um, however, if we are still cautious and we feel that the that we still need to fight the virus, as I mentioned at the end of my testimony, uh, then it's probably uh, a little more economic relief uh, is necessary for the time being. The, uh, the biggest portion of the corporate relief that Mr. Doggett was referring to earlier was the payroll protection program. What did the payroll protection program do, Mr. Pomelo? Yeah, so just very generally, um, it was it provided um, for forgivable loans to small businesses um, to keep their workers employed. Um, and to keep and the workers employed, so the workers really were the primary Oh, sorry, repeat that. To keep the workers employed, so the workers were really the primary beneficiary of that, correct? Yeah, this goes back to my earlier point that there's really not much, it, it's, it's not useful to make a distinction between relief for business and relief for individuals because business is just an entity that ultimately employs a lot of people and has owners. So that, that's the proper unit of analysis here. And the, and the purpose of it was to encourage businesses to keep employed people who they would otherwise have laid off, correct? Correct. Um, so I, I don't know, the jury may still be out on its total effectiveness, but the goal of it was to keep employees in, in the employer relationship maintained. I live in, in, uh, in a big resort area called Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and I can tell you that there was no industry more affected by this virus uh, than, than tourism and hospitality. And it shut down hotels and restaurants. I actually have 1,700 restaurants in my district. And, uh, and those places were actually ordered shut down. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, have people into their businesses. And I have heard from employer after employer after employer thanking me because they were able to keep the employees on payroll through the payroll protection program throughout this pandemic. They were able to protect employees, they were able to keep their businesses together. And now, you know, that the restrictions have eased and people are back to work, uh, they have survived because of it. And the beneficiaries of that actually have been the frontline workers, the people on the lower end who otherwise would have been laid off for months. Uh, have gotten paycheck continued because of this uh, this provision in the CARES Act. So I would strongly push back on Mr. Doggett's characterization that this is all about big, big business. In fact, uh, the payroll protection uh, program, Mr. Pomelo, it was limited to small businesses, correct? Yes. So uh, 
uh, and also, Mr. Pomeroy, you referenced the fact that we need to make sure that that if when people go back to work that they're safe. Would you would you think that it would be a good idea to perhaps have a credit for businesses at some level? The government would help them make their workplaces safe for people to come back to work. Yeah, so I, I think there is logic to the underlying idea to make sure that um, businesses improve improve the environment for workers so that they feel safe to go back to work. Whether that's a tax credit or other sorts of incentives, I think that that's up in the air. You know, I'm somewhat of a tax policy purist. I'd like to see less stuff in the tax code, but I do understand the, the logic here. You know, uh, Mr. Doggett said Republicans have held the line against increasing uh, credits for uh, people on the lower end. Did the, did the Republican tax bill that not one Democrat voted for, did it change the child tax credit at all? Yes, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it did expand the child tax credit by increasing okay. its yeah. refundability. It did. I thought Mr. Doggett just said that Republicans held the line against uh, expanding tax credit for people on the lower end. It did expand the child tax credit? It did expand the child tax credit. Okay. Hey, well, the gentleman's time has expired. I yield um, now recognize uh, Mr. Larson for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses as well for their uh, testimony. Uh, COVID-19 has demonstrated both the public health of the nation and our economy. And I thank Mr. Parmelo for pointing that out, are inextricably linked and tied. And if we're going to be successful, we have to address both. And I think it's helpful you know, to have hearings like this with expert witnesses, because truly, that's what we need to do. In Mr. Parmelo's uh, testimony, he talked about the success of the CARES Act that was instituted by Democrats and joined with Republicans in coming up with a solution. The HEROES Act also presents that same opportunity, but so does the opportunity here for us to address what's going on. I want to uh, Submit for the record, on Tuesday, it was Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell who testified in front of the Senate Banking Committee. I submit for uh, the record his opening statement. Uh, what Chairman Powell said is low income, households, uh, low income households have experienced by far the sharpest drop in employment, while job losses for African Americans, Hispanics, and women have been greater than that of any other groups. If not contained and reversed, the downturn could further widen gaps in economic well being that the long expansion had made some progress in closing. Our colleague, our great colleague, John Lewis, uh, has said that at its core, this is a civil rights issue. And uh, Chairman Paul points out our nation's health and economy is inextricably linked and tied. Uh, I think uh, uh, the questions I want to get to is that we have we have uh, an opportunity here to come together. Uh, I have long believed that what we need to do is take our existing programs and expand upon them. For example, this committee has taken up the Secures Act. This committee has sought to deal with pension reform, and yet we also know that this committee has uh, priority with regard to Social Security something that the Congress has neglected for over 37 years and hasn't had an expansion in 55 years. But if we argue, as I was taught in the private sector, that there's three legs on the stool, shouldn't we be seeking to prop up all three of those legs and make sure that we're providing the most basic of requirements to those that have been left behind, including the 5 million people currently on Social Security who receive below uh, minimum income checks for their efforts that they paid into throughout a, a lifetime. Uh, my first question is, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dadagupta, uh, according to the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, an estimated 108,000 Connecticut residents will risk missing out on their economic impact payment if they don't fill out a form with the IRS. These constituents are most likely to be the lowest income earners. Can you expand 
or expound upon the importance of investing in programs that have already high participation and efficiency rates, such as you elaborated on like EITC, CTC, and of course, social security. Absolutely, and this is a really crucial point you bring up, uh, Representative Larson, that uh, we uh, can write policy um, in Congress and uh, not have it have the intended effect uh, when we don't uh, think hard about what people's lives are really like. Um, so we should keep in mind how much uh, people who actually participate and can benefit from these programs are as much experts um, as anyone else. So the recovery rebates or economic impact payments are uh, right now likely to miss up to maybe 12 million or so people who would otherwise be eligible. And uh, we will need aggressive outreach, uh, but we could have done more to take advantage of, for example, the SNAP program or the WIC program, which have extraordinarily right. high participation and uh, could have helped us reach a lot of these uh, households who desperately need uh, the resources. Um, look, uh, nobody wants uh, programs uh, to be inefficient um, and to be slow to respond. Uh, but what we need to do is think hard about who uh, various programs reach. And uh, the EITC for workers with qualified children, for example, has extraordinary participation rates of 80% uh, or potentially more. But then you look at the participation among uh, workers without qualified children and the participation rates are maybe half that. And that's likely in part because the credit is so modest. Um, so uh, it was great to see, unfortunately, due to a lot of pressure, um, but that the Treasury Department and IRS ultimately took advantage of uh, its ability to deliver payments um, through um, the economic impact payments, uh, through Social Security, through veterans, um, and I, uh, other programs. And I think that going forward, we need to make sure that that's not optional and that in fact, uh, the Treasury Department uh, works even more expansively to reach a lot of folks who are likely to be left out. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Swikert, you're recognized for five minutes. I hit the unmute. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I were to actually reach out to, um, and forgive me, I have a new coon hound who decided to just come visit me. Um, if I was to reach out to our witnesses and say, what policies on the t in the tax front could we adopt that would do multiple things, um, help stability for those of us, uh, those of our brothers and sisters who are on the lower side of the economic spectrum, but also would start to get economic expansion, some velocity as quickly as possible. And, and I understand we, we, we have an, an unknown in front of us, and that is what's happening with the virus. Um, Kyle, if, if I came to you right now and said, give me one or two things this subcommittee should move forward on that would produce the most job growth, the most opportunity in our society, what would they be? Yeah. Thank you for the question. So I think that there are, are there are two things considered. One, and I've already been over this, is like is that there are still a lot of individuals in businesses that need relief. I think that if individuals continue need, to need relief, that a, another round of payments is justified for businesses. I think that if the downturn continues and the economy is still south, I think that extending the net operating loss provision or the expansion of the net interest deduction provision um, is appropriate. I also think that lawmakers should look forward, um, especially on the business front, is that at provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that are going to expire. Um, for example, in 2022, the 100% the, uh, bonus depreciation will start to phase out around the same time. Uh, it, intellectual property investment will need to be amortized. These are things that could work against the economy that, that would reduce cash flow and I think should could, could be paused if the economy is still not up and running by then. All right, but if I came to you and said, all right, we have these sorts of provisions, um, is there a model that, that I could convince you know, my friends on the other side that these would have impact on um, job vitality. If, if, if right now we're, we're having one of these really uncomfortable moments in US history where 
you know, we see the unemployment rates, we, we see the hardship, we see the suffering out there. What do we do from a policy standpoint? You know, we can, we've already heard testimony that, okay, some more direct payments, um, you know, money for things like childcare and these things, fine. What do we also do to actually get employment and opportunity? Because before this happened, we were finally seeing sort of that miracle we had had about 24, 30 months of a real breakthrough in wage gains for our, I always hate this term, but our lowest quartile of income groups. I know it's going to be difficult getting back to that, but, but you know, from a tax standpoint, if, if I asked you for just three, what are they? Yeah, so we should be mo modest about what the impact of tax policy could have at a time like this. I, I go back to virus containment and staying out of the way. And I, I also think that revisiting some of the provisions in the TCJA that are going to phase out, whether that's expensing or amortization, I think that those those are the things you that you should look at. I, in tax policy, whether it's for economic growth or anything, there's no silver bullet. Um, it, so I want to you consider avoid any type of um, implied direct um, um, uh, offsets type of incentive for hiring or um, for a business to do employment uh, of individuals at, at certain salary thresholds. What would you consider? Yeah, so if you were looking to reduce the after-tax cost of hiring people, um, that could be some combination of a payroll tax cut for employers or earned income tax cut expansion. Those are roughly similar uh, in their effectiveness. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's sort of what I was looking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're now going to go to a two to one ratio uh, with our uh, members asking questions. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to start by thanking our witnesses today because their testimony has been very powerful. I hope that my colleagues on the other side of the Capitol take note even a little bit of what has been shared by them. Families cannot wait for relief and workers deserve a fair tax code, not one that gives them a handout, one that gives them a fair chance. I've been proud to champion several bills for family caregivers and workers. As a mother to an 11 year old, I know all too well how difficult it is to not have childcare. I'm proud that my legislation to help cover employees' expenses related to the pandemic was included in the most recent package that passed the House. But we have to do better for caregivers. And not surprisingly, the majority of caregivers are, yes, working mo mothers, working women. California has over four and a half million family caregivers who provide an estimated $63 billion in unpaid care annually. And the pandemic is severely impacting this unique population and we have to do better for them. Ms. Mitsui, can you share your thoughts on ways that we can better target our work to help these people, specifically family caregivers? Thank you very much for the question, Congresswoman. Um, I will say that many of the tax provisions in the HEROES Act, including make, um, expanding the refundable tax credits, will hopefully provide some relief and support for family caregivers. Um, as you noted, um, women often tend to shoulder the burden of um, caregiving responsibilities disproportionately. And there certainly have been a lot of stories about, you know, because the childcare system has not had the support it needs in order to operate safely, help care, help child care providers make it through the pandemic and enable safety regulations to be met. There is a concern that women who tend to be lower paid in a family may end up having to leave the workforce or cut back on paid work in order to provide care. So I think that the, the tax relief that is in the HEROES Act, including making the child independent care tax credit refundable, but if paired with um, a significant and robust investment in child care through the Child Care and Development Fund and CCDBG, as well as the paid family and medical leave provisions and making those permanent and more comprehensive are all supports that can help families balance their work and caregiving responsibilities. Thank you, Ms. Mitsui. Um, we're trying to get people into the workforce, not sideline them. And for too many women, that's going to be the reality if there are not investments made in childcare. Um, Ms. Rodriguez, 
Thank you for sharing your very personal story and your honest struggles with us today. Your experience is not unique. It's like many people in the communities that I represent. And uh, you speak on behalf of millions of working parents who are finding themselves just caught in this situation where they don't have the financial wherewithal to keep their family together. Um, hopefully your input will help members on this committee renew their commitment to fight on behalf of working parents. Um, you've heard many comments and questions made by committee members today. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share based upon what you've heard so far. Um, I think we're fighting for one reason, you know, we don't know what's going on with this virus, but we really want to go back to work and we want childcare for our kids and we want a safe place to start working. So it's the most important thing. And uh, we really need a relief ra like right away because we are not sure what's going on with our jobs. And we are, I don't feel like secure to go out and work anywhere, anywhere because I have two kids and I want to live for them. You know, I'm like, they are my reason and I wanna be good for them. So I think we are going fighting for the same reason. And I think it's very important to have like a relief di directly to a person who made taxes, even though if they are legal or not, if yes. they made taxes, they can have a pay a check. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. They are paying taxes and they are really important for the country, you know, because they are contributing with the taxes. Thank so, you, Mrs. Rodriguez. I, I totally understand that. And I do want to get to a last question because it's something that you touched on. Ms. Mitsui, with the time that I have left, I'm hoping you could talk to us about the interplay between tax assistance and direct assistance programs, because to me, they're complementary and they must go hand in hand. And I'm hearing a little bit of that from Ms. Rodriguez. Can you comment on that? Yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, as you noted, the ch child care providers right now are, are operating on very low margins. Many of them have closed. Those that are, are operating are working at half capacity. They don't have the funds, many of them, to have kind of the health and safety materials that they need. So um, in addition, the Child Care and Development Block Grant through the Child Care and Development Fund offers direct assistance to families, to low and moderate income working families. Unfortunately, only one in six eligible children can receive those funds because of the, at the current level of funding. So the refundable tax credit can help parents who um, cannot afford childcare pay for the childcare that they've already paid out of pocket, but it, it has to work in tandem with both direct assistance that pays for child care as it comes due and also supports the child care system. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I yield back. Time Thank you, Mr. Time Chairman. Expired. Uh, is Ms. Delbaney able to uh, inquire? I am, Mr. Chairman. Um, You're recognized you. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this important hearing and uh, thanks to all of our witnesses for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I wanted to first respond to changes um, in the child tax credit that uh, Mr. Rice raised um, in the Republican tax bill. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expanded the child tax credit to $2,000 um, for taxpayers with income as high as $400,000, but Republicans failed to increase the refundable credit to that same amount or lower the earned income threshold to zero or increase the credit percentage or eliminate the tie to earn income altogether. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ensured that the poorest Americans whose children arguably would benefit from the increase the most didn't benefit, um, which is a big reason why last year I introduced the American Family Act with Congresswoman um, DeLauro, which would meaningfully, meaningfully expand the child tax credit. The HEROES Act included a one-year expansion of the child tax credit, making it fully refundable increasing the amount to $3,000 per child and $3,600 for children under six, makes 17 year olds qualifying children and gives the Secretary of Treasury authority to provide the enhanced credit as an advanced or monthly payment. 
um, new re research from the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University shows that pre-pandemic, a child tax credit expansion like that included in the HEROES Act would cut the child poverty rate by two fifths and the poverty rate for black children in half. With the COVID-19 recession, current child poverty rates are projected to be even higher than these estimates. And the HEROES Act would reduce child poverty from this higher baseline. Um, Ms. Rodriguez, um, thank you again so much for being here today from our great state of Washington. Um, under the child tax credit expansion in the HEROES Act, families could receive $250 per child and $300 per child under the age of six each month. So I wondered if you could talk about how the expansion of the child tax credit um, in that way would help your family and the importance of making sure that the Senate acts quickly to make that happen. We'll be really good because right now we have to pay food and the food is really expensive, let me tell you everything going up. So if we don't have like the same money as before, this money will be really helpful because we don't want to be like a public charge, like start asking for more and more help. So if it's directly, it will be great. Um, I will be really happy to hear that and we don't feel like what we are going to do for the next day and if we are going to have food or not, or if we, are, we have to pay our bills or save money for food um, will be really helpful, but will be better directly to our families because if you guys give money to a employer, sometimes they don't they don't give they don't pass the money to the families. So will be better if we have the money directly. Thank you, uh, Ms. Boval Ammon. Um, what do you think is needed to build long term financial stability for families? and address the racial inequality that's been highlighted by this crisis. Thank you um, for the opportunity to respond to this. I think, you know, right now, the health of communities, particularly marginalized communities across our country are really front and center in our uh, discussions. And we're really seeing the devastating effects um, that those disparities can have in the context of this virus. But the epidemics of poverty and racism um, that predate this virus have been making people sick and have been shortening people's lives for generations. And so I really think that it now is the time to have this um, discussion as you are raising, um, because the inequities um, that have been created by this virus and have been created by this current recession um, are, are just being exacerbated. They're not being created, they're being exacerbated. And so if we really wanna live in a country where every child born has an opportunity to thrive, then we need bold policies like those found in the Americans Families Act and others that extend benefits benefits, increase the credits for families, starting with the lowest income families, so that they're able to afford basic needs today, tomorrow, and well after the end of this pandemic for long-term stability and health of our children. Thank you so much, um, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Smith. Um, and I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony today uh, and for holding this hearing. Um, and I, Mr. Pomelo, um, you mentioned uh, in your opening statement, you, you highlighted a little bit just kind of the unprecedented measures that we have engaged in as a Congress when it comes to response to the coronavirus. Uh, and you look at the amount of money, uh, over $3 trillion that we have appropriated and put into the economy, uh, really unprecedented amount. That's the most money we've ever spent in the history of our country in this short period of time in terms of our response. In addition, we allowed the Fed uh, through the CARES Act the ability to put another three to five trillion in liquidity measures into the economy. And so um, all of those things uh, obviously have been um, particularly the appropriated money have been put on the proverbial federal credit card and uh, we didn't have a rainy day fund. And so this continues to add to our debt. We're up to over $25 trillion. This country's in debt. And that debt bomb that has been created is, is going to cause us problems down the road. And, um, and I'm going to have you comment on that in a second, Mr. Pomelo, if I can. 
But I think as we look at, uh, as part of this hearing today, and we look at what are the next steps uh, to incentivize uh, growth, to allow people to prosper and thrive and get people back to work and get to the, 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 the economy that we had pre-COVID, which was the best in my lifetime uh, in terms of unemployment, in terms of opportunities, in terms of jobs, um, in terms of uh, stock market, all of those things. Um, and I think we almost have to look sector by sector and business entity by business entity in terms of who's been disproportionately affected moving forward. And uh, obviously, it's also, I think, important, um, and I believe, obviously, health and safety is the number one priority that we have to look out for uh, as we continue to have COVID without a cure or a treatment or a vaccine. But obviously, shutting down the economy indefinitely will not accomplish um, the, the goals of safety and health. And so, um, again, we have to find that balance, uh, that measured approach moving forward to do that. And I believe in order to restore our economy to its pre-COVID strength, it's essential that workers and consumers are safe uh, participating in, in their workplace. Um, that's why um, we as Republicans and, and a number of uh, Democrats support tax incentives to help businesses to take the steps necessary to ensure um, that this is the case and that, that we're able to open businesses safely. That brings me to a piece of legislation that I want to mention uh, called uh, the Clean Start Back to Work Tax Credit Act uh, that I am um, uh, sponsoring with Stephanie Murphy of, of Florida. Uh, and, and we believe this is, uh, again, looking at um, what are the priorities as businesses begin to open up so that people can go back to work safely. We want to clean um, safe, sanitized workplace. And, and what our bill um, does is, in short, the legislation creates a temporary tax credit to help businesses cover the increased costs of training, um, to help uh, properly sanitize surfaces, cleaning services, cleaning supplies, and PPP as they start to reopen. And, and uh, qualifying entities can apply for a 50% refundable tax credit of up to $25,000 per unique location and up to 250,000 maximum. We believe ideas like this are very, very important. And secondly, again, when we think sector by sector, another one that's been disproportionately affected has been um, uh, the beauty industry, barbershops, beauty salons. In many states, uh, they're just starting to open. And so, uh, again, I've introduced a piece of leg legislation with Congresswoman Del Benny and also with uh, Senator Portman and Senator Cardin um, that uh, is called the Small Business Tax Fairness and Compliance Simplification Act. And in short, our goal is to extend Section 45B, currently available to restaurants, to the beauty industry and barbershops, uh, because they have been disproportionately affected. And so um, we believe um, that this is important for that industry and look forward to working on behalf of that. Um, um, having mentioned that, Mr. Pomelo, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on my earlier comments about um, uh, the, the amount of debt that we continue to create in this country and the ramifications of that and the fact that we're not going to be able to spend our way out of this um, corona epidemic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So e even before the pandemic, the CBO projected that federal debt held by the public as a percent of GDP was around 80% uh, this year and would climb to about 97% in 2030. And you mentioned the additional spending would, in, uh, would the relief would be over $3 trillion. It's about $4 trillion, but that doesn't even account for the slower economic output that we are already seeing that's going to increase that more. Um, so it's certainly something to, to keep in mind. But as I mentioned in my testimony, I don't think it's something to be concerned right now. I think the cost of doing too little in economic relief is greater than, than doing too little. So I think, and if you just look at the, the indicators here for uh, US Treasury rate below 1% and federal spending on interest expense has been below 2% for many years and has continued to be below 2%. Um, so we're not seeing that it's crowding out too much more important government spending. So it seems it's we still have space. Um, you know, that said, you know, it's certainly something that will need to be addressed in the future, and I'm hoping it's addressed after uh, we have solved the current economic uh, issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Gentlemen, time has expired.
Uh, Ms. Moore, you're recognized for five minutes. You may have to unmute. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and ranking member and members. My time is limited. Um, so I have to choose what I talk about very carefully because I'd love to ask questions of each and every one of you. I want to start out by saying how good it is to know that Mr. Rice is on the bend. Um, you, you know, always good to know that somebody's beating this stuff. Um, I guess I want to start out by saying to um, Ms. Um, um, Martha Rodriguez, when they say that uh, unemployment has um, uh, has been lowered among African Americans or Latin folks. They're talking about folks like you and your husband, the people with four jobs. So I just so whenever you hear that we have a lower, you know, unemployment rate, think about what it had been when you had your four jobs, uh, and no one should have to work four jobs uh, to take care of a family. Uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Palmer a question. Um, you made a comment that we should not raise taxes while the economy is weak. Uh, and I guess um, I'm wondering, do you also think we should not raise taxes on the poor? Um, as you know, uh, as others have said here today, uh, that we can tax people into poverty. And we can do that by being austere, uh, and for example, you know, being in denial that we need other economic uh, impact payments. So would you agree, um, Mr. Apomero, if we're protecting, you know, wealthier people or people who are more secure, that we should uh, also not raise taxes on the poor? Yeah, this is a pretty good transition from my previous statement. I think that you know, you, you, there is no reason to be raising taxes on whether uh, low-income households or high income. Okay, well, what I mean, I mean, those who are don't pay taxes either, those who need things like the earned income tax and the child tax credit, do you endorse those proposals, which um, uh, where people don't necessarily have a income tax liability and we still provide them with the monies? So I think there's a question as to whether you should be expanding those refundable credits or providing um, an additional uh, check to individuals. I think one of the virtues of the one-time economic impact payments that could become two-time is the speed at which the relief can be provided. Um, okay, well, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just, I'm just trying to, right, because this, um, let me move on. This pandemic is, uh, we've heard from uh, uh, other experts here that we can expect these economic impacts to last probably through 2021. That being the case, um, I guess I want to know, you know, what's the sustainability of of um, things like the economic impact payments versus expanding the earned income tax credit? And maybe um, I ought to ask uh, Allison to take up uh, the rest of the time talking about starting the process now of building some recovery, um, because if we've got um, I, I saw several of you have said that poverty among children is now at 40 percent. Um, so can you just share with us uh, the importance of putting in place something to uh, prevent hunger, starvation and homelessness and health problems among children? Yes, I, I'm glad to speak to this. I think it is important, um, as has been noted, the economic um, impact payments provided short-term relief. We know that this is going to continue well into the future, and we don't have to look very far. We saw it happen in the Great Recession, child poverty rates were skyrocketing, and expansions to things like the Earned Income Tax Credit and Child Tax Credit really were effective in mitigating those um, hardships. Thank you so much. And let me ask you this. Um, I have a proposal, the Worker Act, and I'm so pleased that you look through it. Just comment on what it might do uh, for our economic foundation going forward. Yes, I think a couple of pieces that are really important here. Um, unpaid caregivers have already mentioned that they are, um, even though they provide valuable um, assets to our society, both with children, people with disabilities, and elders, they are left out of many of these tax provisions. And so that bill would extend these benefits to those taxpayers. I should note that even when people don't have an income tax eligible uh, income tax obligation, they pay a lot of other taxes. And so it would extend the 
uh, credits to those people. It also provides monthly payments, which I think is important. I do want to note that the health benefits often go through things like healthy behaviors and through reductions in stress. And we know that we need those sorts of um, those sorts of healthy behaviors, like purchasing nutritious foods, like reducing the stress of paying bills. We need families to be able to do that every single month, not just at tax time. Thank you. Thank you. My time has expired. It's expired. I want to recognize Mr. Larson for the purpose of a unanimous consent request. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would like to submit for the record a uh, statement from the Insured Retirement Institute, as well as the Joint Trade Association letter to help retirement savers recover from the pandemic. And uh, I thank you that I, I, I missed that before. And thank you for the opportunity to submit that for the record. But without objection, since it's in the order. Uh, could all members please mute? Uh, we're getting some feedback. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boyle does not wish to inquire. I'll recognize Mr. Beyer for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. <clears throat> I'd like to turn to Mr. Pomelo first. You discuss your opposition to <clears throat> quote unquote arbitrary limitations on tax benefits on the corporate side. I'd like to push back a little bit and say there's not much arbitrary about trying to rein in excessive CEO compensation, which as of 2019 was 271 to one over the average worker. By comparison in 1965, it was 20 to one. Uh, the average CEO Fortune 500 made more than $17 million in 2018. Or stock buybacks where we went out of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, 85% of that money went for either stock buybacks or shareholder returns, mostly to manipulate CEO pay. So. If we're against arbitrary limitations, how about the $500 dependent rebates and the CARES Act, which were limited to taxpayers with dependent, arbitrarily limited to taxpayers with children under the age of 17. So you had an adult child with a significant disability or you're taking care of your Alzheimer's parents, you are not eligible for that. Perhaps more arbitrary than NOL limitations based on corporate practices. Wouldn't you think perhaps that we should expand those things from the CARE Act, get rid of the arbitrariness of limiting this, these rebates? I, I have no problem expanding the definition of what is considered a dependent under the economic impact payments. I actually estimated that um, using, switching from the definition under the child tax credit um, which is children under the age of 17, to using the definition that's used for the dependent exemption um, under prior law um, would expand eligibility by about 26 million um, dependents. Thank you very much. And Mr. Um, Dada Gupta, you know, I, I've been a major proponent of expanding unemployment compensation and specifically trying to tie those benefits to economic conditions as long as there's necessary. And I really want to thank you for all of your really helpful advice in this arena. You know, because expanded unemployment compensation has been a critical lifeline for millions and millions of people. But with good reason, we're focusing on responses to this crisis. But as you and other panelists have eloquently no noted, and as our wonderful witness from Washington State, COVID-19 has fallen hardest on those who have the least and has really exposed the underlying economic wealth inequality in our society. Mr. Dunagupta, doesn't that point to our need to think beyond the near term as we structure tax policy in response to this crisis? Thank you, Representative Beyer, including for your leadership on ensuring that our uh, response is really tied to economic conditions. Um, and. Uh, I would definitely agree with you. Um, we are benefiting uh, from the fact that people did not experience the Great Depression and say, let's just do temporary, timely, and targeted things. Uh, they established the Social Security Act and um, took other measures um, that created at least some foundation for us today uh, to be able to get some money out the door quickly. Um, and with all of its struggles, the unemployment insurance system um, is one of the only, if not the only ways we can get out weekly checks uh, to people who need it. Um, so uh, 
I think that uh, the last economic expansion, again, one of the longest, if not the longest in U.S. history, um, still left millions of households uh, behind um, and inequality uh, persisted at extreme levels, um, including an extraordinary racial wealth gap uh, where we've made little progress. Um, you know, the black white home ownership gaps are um, actually worse today than they were um, more than a century ago. Um, so we really should take the opportunity uh, going forward to think about how we can uh, lay the foundation for a much stronger economy. Um, I realize that in the midst of a crisis, we're trying to put out fires. Um, but afterwards, uh, we should ask ourselves, uh, do we want to rebuild the same sort of structure or can we build a new one? Um, and just one thing I would add is that uh, we haven't said this directly, but a major reason why families here are struggling to have even a minimal amount of cash on a weekly or monthly basis is in the 1996 welfare law, we gutted cash assistance and we are uh, paying the price to this day. So proposals like representative, um, uh, like the representatives uh, Del Benny's uh, American Family Act are very much um, worth pursuing. And uh, it makes a lot of sense to include a version of that in the HEROES Act, but we should really um, ask ourselves um, whether it makes sense for them to uh, be much more uh, permanent um, and durable well beyond this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Arrington, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Thompson and uh, Ranking Member Smith, thank you for uh, hosting this hearing and great discussion. I think, obviously, it's incredibly important to deliberate and debate how best to move this country forward uh, uh, into um, uh, through the recovery period and back to the pre-COVID um, performance that we were seeing that was uh, unprecedented. I think it's important because it's a blessing if there ever was one going into this unprecedented public health crisis to have the fundamentals the way they were prior to COVID. And having the lowest unemployment in 50 years, having uh, uh, wages increasing and m more for the low end income earner than the upper income, uh, among the many other things, is a fantastic uh, position to be if you're going to be able to bounce back. Um, I, I think Ms. Uh, Matsui would probably appreciate at least the outcome. She might debate whether it was as a result of pro-growth tax policies. I would say it was absolutely a huge part of that, that women were, were, were and minorities were uh, those who benefited the most in tax uh, in, 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 with the tax reform. I'm looking at a New York Times article that talks about uh, Hispanic women uh, making the most gains in employment um, and that the most of any prime age working group were, were women. And uh, we had the lowest unemployment in African-American and other minority groups. That's, uh, that's something I think we can all champion and cheer for and be proud of. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, um, I really appreciate your story, and uh, certainly you represent hard, uh, hardworking uh, families all across the country, and uh, I thank you for your testimony. Um, we certainly need to find ways to shore up the safety net and provide this sort of temporary targeted assistance uh, to help folks like you, uh, but if you could have a choice between more uh, government assistance and ch stimulus checks and whatever programs we could create, or you could have your job back and you could have the certainty of an income and a place that you go and do what you do to provide a service and provide for your family, which one would you prefer to do at this point? I want to go back to work. I, I really want to work, but I want to work in a safe place. You know, uh, this is what I want. And I, if I wanna, I'm going to back to work and the school is not going to be the same. I'm going to have um, childcare. Sure. And I think everybody were going to need childcare assistance. So, so, 
So, Ms. Rodriguez, I, 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 I so appreciate your desire to work because I think that the most important thing we can do to get our country out of this uh, sort of temporary recession and back to a strong rebound and recovery and, and, and an economy that was growing like I described is to reopen the economy. In Texas, we're about 75% open and we're, we're really trusting the, the, the citizens of Texas to, to know how to safely return to work. And we, we know that there's a, a, a more risk now because of COVID and it's gonna be with us for a while and that we can do some basic things to, to try to manage those risks. But we've trusted the people of Texas. And, and I think long-term, those families are gonna be so much better off than, than if we just try to find ways to temporarily um, uh, keep them just hanging on instead of permanently, sustainably going back to work and making a living. Do you feel like you would know how to responsibly and safely go back to work at this at, at this point, knowing what we know about about COVID? Uh, right now it's summertime and I don't have job because it's yeah. summertime. So but I'm, if everything is going to be OK, I will be returned to work for the next school year. And I hope everybody will be doing the same thing. But the thing that we receive an email that the school is not going to be the same. So this is something that we have to work on it because if the school is going to be hybrid, we, ha we have the kids at home and school. And it's going to be so hard to work and be parents at the same time, you know? And God bless you. Thank you, Thank you, you, very much. Thank you so much. It's expired. I now recognize Mr. Swazi for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all of the witnesses uh, for the work that you've done here today and for your insights. We appreciate uh, all of your time and your help here today. I wanna ask Mr. Pomerlo a question, if I may. Mr. Pomerlo, do you think that state and local governments are an important part of the national economy? Yeah, uh, state and local governments are, uh, they are important employers and there are a lot of people currently employed uh, there. And there, are, uh, I think the number is about 20 million people are employed in state and local governments. Is that correct? That seems about right. And there have been about one and a half million people that have been laid off or furloughed from state and local governments during this recession, which is double the amount of people that have been laid off or furloughed during the quote unquote great recession. Yeah, the layoffs have hit people that both work for the private and public sector. Do you think that the federal government has a role in helping to help these state and local governments? Yeah, so I, the way I see it is that state governments, uh, in contrast to the federal government, they really can't borrow in the same way. They're restricted by balanced budget amendments. So when revenue goes down because the economy goes down, then governments are going to have, they have state and local governments need to tighten their belt and that can lead to layoffs and that can lead to people unexpectedly losing their job. Um, I know that there's concern about, um, about pension bailouts and things like that, but I think it, the very limited lawmaker, lawmakers at the federal level should look at uh, what state and local governments are losing in revenue. So we need the federal government to help the state and local governments. You'd agree with that, right? I think that there is a place for that. We don't want the we don't want local governments to raise taxes, state and local governments to raise taxes. Correct. One of the options, so one of the downsides just, I, is we don't yeah. we don't want them to raise taxes, and we certainly don't want them to continue to lay off employees, correct? Correct. So the only choices for state and local governments with these massive deficits they're facing, which is projected by the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities to be six hundred and fifteen billion dollars. Uh, the only thing they can do is either raise taxes or uh, fire more employees, both of which you think are bad ideas, or get help from the federal government. And I think you would agree with the statements of Governor Hogan, a Republican, and Governor Cuomo, a Democrat, the chair and vice chair of the uh, Governor's Association, quote, each day that Congress fails to act, states are being forced to make cuts that will devastate the essential services the American people rely on and to destroy the economic recovery before it even gets off the ground. I think you'd agree with that statement generally, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, I think that as revenue declines for states, states will have to react by reducing spending. And the Republican president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors says, quote, my message today is straightforward and urgent. American cities are still being devastated by this pandemic, and it's imperative that Congress and the administration take swift action before the beginning of the next fiscal year, which for many cities is July 1st. That's from Mayor uh, Barnett, the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So, Mr. Pomerantz, you are the quote-unquote Republican witness here today, but you are agreeing that our state and local governments need assistance and they need it urgently. Otherwise, they're going to be forced to either raise taxes, which we don't want them to do and is unlikely, or two, continue to further erode the national economy by firing employees. And who's going to be affected by that? The people that are going to be affected are our schools, for example. 47% of the funding of schools in the United States of America is provided by state governments. And the states are devastated right now. The rest of the money that states provide, the biggest percentages, are for health and human services. And then the next biggest percentage after that is for public safety. So I w- would urge you, please, Mr. Pomeroy, any, Pomerlu, any influence that you have on my Republican colleagues, to please encourage them that it's essential for our nation to recover from this recession affected by the, this pandemic is for us to fund and fund quickly our state and local governments. And when Mitch McConnell says this is a blue state bailout and states and local governments should file for bankruptcy, it is really the height of hypocrisy when in fact his state every year receives subsidies from the federal governments from states like mine, the state of New York, which right now is devastated because we have three of the six hardest hit counties in the United States of America, in my congressional district alone, that have been affected by this pandemic. So thank you, Mr. Pomerleau, for your cooperation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you to all the witnesses. Thank you to my colleagues. And thank you so much to the chairman and ranking member for their assistance. And I yield back. He may... um... Dr. Ferguson may be having some problems. Uh, let's skip him right now. We'll come back to him. Uh, let us know when your uh, when your situations change. We'll go to uh, Mr. Davis from Illinois. Recognized for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Chu, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Dutta Gupta, the CARES Act provided families with economic impact payments to provide quick and direct financial stability during an uncertain time. The provision provides $1,200 per adult and $500 per child. I was disappointed, however, that only individuals who filed with a social security number were eligible for this payment. There are over 4 million workers in the United States who file taxes using an individual tax identification number, or ITIN, and they were all left out of this relief. These are workers who pay taxes and contribute to their local economies but are not eligible for relief. What is worse is that even filers who have a Social Security number were left out if they were married to an I-10 filer. That is outrageous. All the members of the family could have been American citizens, but if that one person was an I-10 filer, all of them lost out. And yet, I-10 filers paid $23.6 billion in taxes in 2015. COVID-19 doesn't discriminate and many of the excluded families are experiencing hardships due to the effects of the virus. Uh, like so many Americans. And that's why I I introduced a Coronavirus Immigrant Families Protection Act, which would ensure that I-10 filers are made eligible for these payments. And it was included in the HEROES Act, which the House passed in May. So Mr. Jodagupta, can you expand on how excluding I-10 filers from COVID-19 relief will cause further economic disparities for people of color? Thank you, Representative Chu, for drawing attention to this uh, really important issue. Um, uh, Fundamentally, every time we exclude a marginalized group from relief and assistance and support, we're undermining 
the public health response and the recovery. Um, you mentioned over $25 billion a year in taxes paid by ITIN filers. Even when you subtract out uh, the benefits, uh, public benefits received, you still have a very substantial net uh, payment of over $15 billion um, in net taxes based on 2015 data, for example. This pandemic has made utterly clear that our country faces severe racial disparities in health and economic uh, outcomes. And um, one of the ways that we can address those, um, those disparities, longstanding disparities, is by ensuring that we uh, include everyone um, regardless of immigration status. Um, and we should know here that when uh, we're talking about workers with ITINs, um, they are voluntarily um, uh, complying with tax law, uh, trying to contribute um, to the U.S. Uh, both uh, broadly in the labor market um, and also uh, with regard to taxes. Um, and it includes even um, folks who are from Europe and um, uh, as well as uh, folks from Canada. It's um, disproportionately certainly people from Central America and Asia and Africa as well. Um, and then the final point I just make is right now, when you think about essential frontline workers, in many ways, uh, we are really being buoyed by um, undocumented immigrants and ITIN filers. Um, we owe it to them, um, who they are in many cases, uh, the frontline workers in our health professions, um, in agriculture, keeping our food supply system um, working so that people can still uh, eat um, if they have the resources to afford um, the growing cost of food at home. Um, we really owe it to them, and it will be in the interest of our public health and our economy uh, to ensure that they're included in all future relief. Um, and Ms. Matsui, in the short time I have remaining, there are disparities, and especially for women of color, I was shocked to see AAPI women in California making only 72 cents for every dollar uh, a white man earns. Can you discuss these disparities and the uh, say, say something about the remedies? Thank you very much for the question, Representative Chu. Um, yes, the, re the refundable tax credits of the EITC and child tax credit are very important for AAPI women. In 2019, 1.6 million AAPI women benefited from the EITC and CTC. And because the expansions are targeting in particular and would benefit um, jobs such as healthcare workers, where um, AAPI workers are um, kind of so prominently featured and taking such a strong role now, the Relief in the HEROES Act would also benefit those workers, help to ameliorate the wage gaps, and also help them meet basic needs. Thank you. I go back. Thank you. I thank the gentlewoman. Now recognize Mr. Kildee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me and particularly for allowing me to participate on the subcommittee hearing today, which is so important. Uh, this hearing has highlighted, I think, in really stark terms, the pressing needs for continued support for our working families. Last year, I introduced the Working Families Tax Relief Act with my colleague, on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Mr. Evans, which makes important improvements to the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. These two credits are critically important, and expanding them would positively impact 46 million American households. But the fact is, even before the coronavirus pandemic, too many working families have been struggling just to make ends meet, just to put food on the table, even with the help of the current EITC and child tax credit. So this pandemic has really only increased the burden on these households, a majority of whom uh, are being impacted are, are communities of color, uh, both impacted by the disease and by the economic consequences. Our recovery will take a long time. We've heard that already testified to. Uh, expanding these credits is important to helping these families. And of course, the HEROES Act imported, uh, included important expansions of EITC and the child tax credit. But until the Senate acts, these families are still looking at a really long road ahead. So my question for the panel, perhaps starting with Ms. Matsui, is to help clarify a point. Because listening to some of my colleagues, one would assume that there's a choice either between business loans and tax credits or even expansion of UI 
and EITC and child tax credit. Can you help, uh, starting perhaps with uh, Ms. Matsui, help explain why the EITC and child tax credits are important with or without the necessary support that most of us, or really virtually all of us, agreed to and supported when it comes to business support. We were there with the Paycheck Protection Program. We supported it. We continue to support it. In fact, Senator Booker and I, along with some Republican colleagues, have a bipartisan bill to expand small business support. So we're all in on that. But maybe you can address why it's not necessary for us to choose between supporting small business and assuming that they will then uh, produce benefits for working people and something that clearly makes the case for, uh, for benefits for working people like EIT and the child tax credit. If you could respond, Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much for your question, Representative Kildee, and thank you for your leadership around the refundable tax credits, um, including the Working Families Tax Relief Act. I do appreciate the question because what we know about women and, uh, and workers who are in the lowest paid professions is that even when they are working full time before the pandemic, their incomes are falling below the poverty line or near poverty. They are not making enough on their paychecks alone to support their families. What the refundable tax credits do is, is operate as a wage supplement and operate as an incentive to keep at work, but those are necessary things that they need in order to meet their basic needs and support their families. At the same time, as Ms. Rodriguez, on the, my fellow witness pointed out, there, you can't go back to work until there's a job to go back to. And so it's important to support businesses, just to use the childcare industry as an example, so many childcare providers don't have the wherewithal to spend on investments in health and safety requirements or spacing out children so that they can socially distance and responsibly operate. So there's both need to have the resources so that small businesses and um, um, employers can safely support their workers and both in the meantime, but as on, on an ongoing basis to support the lowest income workers who are going to work every day, generating activity for our economy and, and fulfilling roles that all of us rely on, but can't feed their families. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this really important hearing and uh, yield back my time. Thank you, and thank you for participating. I'll now recognize Mr. Schneider of Illinois for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, like Mr. Kildee said, thank you for allowing me to participate in this um, uh, hearing, uh, though not officially a member of the committee. This has been a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to hear from the witnesses, and I want to thank the witnesses for spending the time with us and, and sharing your perspectives. I will start with building on something that um, Mr. Swazi touched on, and, and that's the, the role state and local governments play and, and the importance um, to our economy. The fiscal challenges they're facing are unprecedented uh, as they uh, are literally on the front lines with first responders protecting our, our um, basic necessities, everything from uh, water and sanitation, uh, uh, you know, basic needs, delivering these services. And that's why I introduced earlier the Supporting State and Local Leaders Act. Uh, this is bipartisan legislation that would provide relief uh, to these uh, state and local governments by allowing them to take the very same payroll tax deduction that our private sector employers are taking uh, to keep their people on the payroll. Critical now is they're looking at, at face with this situation of having to lay people off. Um, and one of the things, and this relates to it, but uh, you know, if, if I had a single word to describe the, the crisis we're in, whether it's for businesses, for uh, municipalities, for workers, and for their families, it's, it's uncertainty uh, with this crisis. Uh, businesses are operating in an environment where they don't know if they're going to be able to open up or have normal operations. And uh, uh, Mr. Rod uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you touched on, on that. We certainly don't know what normal means, whether it's going to be a month from now, six months from now, or a, a year. Uh, the workers are facing incredible job uh, uncertainty with respect to their job security, and that affects their benefits with such things as health insurance and, and, and retirement planning. And families literally are struggling to put food on the table and make ends meet in, in, in the economy as, as we continue to proceed in this uncharted territory. Uh, wherever possible, we rely on the federal government to um, try to provide some of that certainty. That's what we've been talking about today. For businesses, it's to understand the best practices on adapting to accommodate social distancing for families trying to stay safe. We know that once we emerge from this crisis, life in general, and in particular, the economy 
the post-COVID economy will be vastly different than what preceded it. I hope that means galvanized support for a national paid family leave policy and increased flexibility for workers to work from home. But until we get there, we need to give businesses, workers, and families the certainty they need to make it through this crisis. The strongest tool Congress and the federal government has used thus far to impart that certainty are the economic impact payments. They provide workers and families with the certainty that they have some financial assistance in getting through this crisis. The EIPs provide businesses the certainty of sustained consumer spending. Beyond being an incredibly effective, proven, and anti-poverty tool, the EIPs ensure that working families have the economic wherewithal to emerge from this crisis and get back on the road to, to prosperity. That being said, we are at a critical moment in our nation's history, and I think we have a, a, a real opportunity here to reform our tax code to ensure it works for all Americans. We don't know what the economy will look like once we get through this pandemic, but we do know that the economy will di be different. So I'd like the witnesses to address how, at this difficult moment in time, can we actually help make positive change, in particular for struggling workers and, and, and families? And, and Ms. Matsui, maybe we'll start with you. Thank you for the question, um, Representative Schneider. Um, I will say that it does seem like a moment given the importance of um, that we've seen for the care sector as um, as my my fellow witness, Mr. Didagutta mentioned earlier, to invest in child care as a public good and make sure that the burden is not placed either on parents to meet the cost of child care on the workforce and providers to um, provide the high quality learning environment that it's also safe that children need. So investments in the childcare sector to make sure not only that they survive the coronavirus crisis, but that it's recognized as a public good and that we don't continue to devalue the, the labor of caregivers, I think would be a very important step in the in restarting the economy. Great, thanks. I'll just go across my screen. Uh, Mr. Dudagupta. Thank you, Representative Schneider. Just quickly, I'd add that uh, first, I think we need to um, make sure that we have the social infrastructure in place and the administrative infrastructure in place to reach families when they need help. It was uh, far too hard to get resources into families, much easier, say, for the Federal Reserve to backstop, um, you know, the, the business sector uh, than it should have been. We need to make sure that people have access to free free banking. We need to uh, make sure that um, people have ongoing support, just as we were able to in the past dial up um, say social security payments, which Representative Larson mentioned earlier, if we had ongoing payments to families uh, to make sure that they had a basic floor, it would be much easier to dial them up in the future. Great. Thank you. And I apologize to the other witnesses. I'm a guest, so I won't overextend my time. I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Is uh, Dr. Ferguson uh, finished with his call? I'll go to uh, Mr. Panetta for five minutes, and we'll come back to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, Mr. Panetta, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, you holding this hearing. And I also do appreciate, uh, along with the other members who just testified in front of me, for allowing me to sit on this committee hearing and to uh, talk to, have the opportunity to talk to, but more importantly, listen uh, to uh, the witnesses that have been here today. And thank you to all the witnesses who have taken the time to uh, come and uh, present uh, your side of things. I truly appreciate that opportunity. I also want to thank uh, Congresswoman Chu uh, for the work that she has done on something that's very important to us here on the Central Coast of California uh, through her work on the Coronavirus Immigrant Families Protection Act. Obviously, uh, here in the salad bowl of the world, uh, we have a number of immigrants coming in, contributing to our number one uh, in industry and our economy, contributing to our culture. And it was unfortunate that they were not benefits. Many of them uh, even mixed families were not uh, recipients of the benefits of the CARES Act. And I hope that we continue to push that issue, uh, especially with uh, Congresswoman Chu's leadership. So I, I look forward to continuing to help her and be a part of that. Um, obviously, we know that the pandemic is taking a toll on everyone. But as today's witnesses have highlight, highlighted, it's not taking a toll on everyone equal. It's, take, it's not taking a toll on everyone equally. Congress has responded boldly. I think we all understand that with the $2.2 trillion CARES Act, which provided direct monetary payments, supplemental unemployment benefits, and put in place certain protections for renters and homeowners. However, we all recognize that more needs to be done. Yes, we provided temporary relief, but that's sort of all it was. It was just temporary. And yes, it preserved our economy, 
But as has been highlighted by the, your hearing today, Mr. Chairman, it left out a number of those who continue to contribute to our economy. And we should be looking at ways beyond just returning to where we were. We can take this opportunity to create a more equitable economy, yes, by expanding the EITC, providing uh, the CTC, creating a more resilient social safety net, and yes, being better prepared for the next economic downturn. Now, one of the ways I think that we've tried to do that in the CARES Act, but also in the Hero HEROES Act, is looking at housing. Here on the Central Coast, unfortunately, housing is very, very expensive. Uh, and it can prevent a number of, uh, a, a number of people from continuing with their lives, especially in this difficult time. Now, yes, renter protections have been put in place, but I think there needs to be more when it comes to rental assistance to families. And so I do believe that we must confront an issue of housing supply, not just rental assistance, but housing supply, which we can do through the tax code, through programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Uh, and so I'd like to direct this question to Professor, Professor Duda Gupta uh, in that I want you to talk about how the availability of affordable housing, how it can be a challenge for families, and how it compounds other challenges that they're facing this time during the pandemic, but in other areas, in, in all times, like here on the Central Coast. Thank you for that question, Representative Panetta. Um, housing is for the vast majority of low and moderate income families, the single biggest part of their budget. Um, and the lack of supply of affordable housing is uh, has been a longstanding problem, but especially uh, during this economic expansion, uh, just to underscore that um, it was not delivering uh, benefits for everyone. Um, and in particular, uh, it can lead to challenges of not only overcrowded housing, but also lack of access to jobs or uh, schools and education opportunities. Um, and so we need to uh, really uh, do a lot more to tackle housing. We have uh, just a fraction of people today who are even eligible for housing assistance, which is more on the demand side than supply side. But um, look, we need to create new jobs coming out of this crisis. We can think about creating jobs in the care sector. We can think about doing it with regard to the climate crisis as well, but we can also do it with regard to physical infrastructure. We don't have enough affordable housing. People can be put to work to build that. We don't have you know, clean water still to this day in, in parts of the country, including Flint, Michigan. People can be put to work to meet these national needs. So thank you for your uh, leadership and drawing attention to the issue. And I, I hope uh, we do take seriously the need for doing uh, far more than we are to address housing um, burdens in this country. Thank you. And I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, Representative Susan Del Benny uh, for her efforts when it comes to low income housing tax credit. Thank you for that as well. Uh, but uh, also moving, sticking with you, Professor, um, the, the multiplier effect. I think it's been interesting uh, how we've seen it, you know, saving personal savings rate increase. But obviously, with low income individuals and families, that hasn't been the case. They've been putting it right back into economy. Briefly, can you address the multiplier effect? In Absolutely. Three, in three words. Look, or less. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's there. And if you give people more certainty, there'll be more. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again. Mr. Ferguson with us. Mr. Ferguson with us. Well, we've uh, we've uh, heard from all the witnesses. Thank you all very much for participating. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm I am I am online. Whoa, there he is. All right, <laughs> I'm going to recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like uh, unanimous consent to enter in the written testimony of my colleague, George Holding, who could not be with us today. Without objection, such will also, be ordered. Also, uh, there is a letter to the Treasury um, that, uh, that, uh, that, he would, uh, that he would like uh, entered into the record as well. I'd ask for unanimous consent on that. Without also. objection. Without okay. objection. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for for holding this important hearing. And um, listen, I, I I look at where where we are in the country right now, and I, I, I'm starting to be able to see some differences between different parts of the country that are opening up and those that aren't. And I look at what's happening here in Georgia, and it's pretty amazing to see um, the rebound in the economy. I had the uh, the pleasure of going out and touring around my district uh, this past week, and um, a couple, one of the cities that I went to see that is completely dependent on tourism 
uh, told me that uh, the sales tax revenue for their city uh, for the entire year was was only off a thousand dollars for the same period last year, which I think is pretty remarkable. It shows that when the economy opens back up, um, people people can go about their normal business in in, in new ways, and I think that they are doing. Um, I think that uh, what we're what we're seeing here in Georgia is is that we are seeing a rebound in the economy. Um, we still have we still have tremendous capacity in our healthcare system to be able to take care um, of individuals that need to be into the go into the hospital. And I think what we've done here is we did exactly what we set out to do, which is to bend the infection rate curve down so that we didn't overwhelm the hospital. It's never about stopping the spread of the, vi the virus; it was about slowing the spread of the virus. And I think that we've done that. And I'm uh, hats off to America for that. And now I think is the time to smartly reopen this country and return the dignity of work to people's lives. And let's start let's start in a very methodical way rebuilding this great American economy. Um, so with that being said, you know I think that I think that there've been some some uh, some good ideas discussed here. You know I am I, I think that we need to be incredibly innovative with the tax code, um, not just in the short term, but but as we need to as we need to look ahead to what our economy will be. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that, that we can all agree on, we have to protect American intellectual property. And we want to make sure that uh, intellectual, that we recognize that intellectual property is the backbone of, of future manufacturing, the ideas and the processes that we develop here in America. Um, you know, those are going to lead to the new, the new manufacturing processes, whether it's in biotech, whether it's in um, genetics, whether it's in, whether it's in traditional manufacturing. Um, so, Mr. Parmelo, the thing that I'd like to ask you is, can, do you think it would be advantageous for us to consider things in the tax code that would make repatriating um, intellectual property um, possible and more advantageous? Thank you for the question. So I think that this is actually a pretty good tax policy question here. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I think, did two things. Um, that, that may impact intellectual property investment. And I think lawmakers might want to revisit both of them at some point in the future, although it may not be appropriate within a pandemic uh, setting. The first is that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, scheduled um, the treatment of intellectual property investment um, to go from being expensed, meaning that companies can fully deduct those costs in the first year, and starting in 2021, those would need to be amortized or deducted in stages over a period of five years. This was passed. I don't think there was a strong just policy justification for it. More, it was more for raising revenue to offset the cost of the corporate rate reduction. The downside is that it would increase the after the it would reduce the return to intellectual property investment in the United States and reduce the amount that we would have overall in, in America. So I think that lawmakers should address that um, if they are concerned about intellectual property investment. The second is the treatment of intellectual property income overseas. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did uh, change the treatment um, of IP income through the, the guilty global intangible low tax income and the treatment um, of IP stashed here, uh, the foreign derived intangible income. Those provisions, um, were meant to kind of level the playing field in terms of taxation of intellectual property products, whether they were placed here or placed abroad. Uh, I know that uh, over the past couple of years, we found a lot of bugs in those, and I think lawmakers could um, begin to address those bugs that may improve the effectiveness of those provisions as well. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you know, look, when, an issue that, that we talk about an awful lot, and, I, and I've, and I've really worked on as, as a, lot, a lot of members have on both sides of the aisle, uh, and that is access to broadband in our rural communities. Um, I think that we've got a unique opportunity right now to, to, to showcase uh, the, the talent that's in rural America. Um, look, you, there's, there's some great advantages to, to hiring folks that work in, work in rural areas. Problem is, is that in this economy, they don't have access to broadband. And so I'm thinking about not only how do we expand broadband um, and what are the right tax policies needed to, to, to help the private sector invest um, smartly in a much different way in rural broadband, but also, you know, what, how, 
think about, do you have any ideas or any suggestions or do you think it'd be helpful if you had a tax credit system that, that favored hiring somebody in a rural community as opposed to an urban community? Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. So if the, uh, Kyle, if you can get back to Mr. Ferguson uh, in writing on that and certainly an issue that is shared by all members of Congress and the need uh, has been uh, shown now with the reliance on telemedicine uh, through this uh, uh, COVID pandemic and distance learning. So th there's a lot of good there. Thank you for, uh, for raising it. Uh, that concludes all of our questions. I wanna thank the witnesses for joining us today. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. Thank you all very much. It was a great hearing. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned.